the gun you get another My name is Tabitha Scoble, yeah. and I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. But first, before I do that, I want to tell you about a few other things that we have. And everything starts with an S, so it should be really easy, but I didn't put them in alphabetical order. <laughs> We've got surveys on the table. If you could please fill out a survey, if you can think of anyone who could speak for us or a topic you would like to hear on, um, hear about. That's how we try to um, get new speakers and uh, we appreciate any feedback. Uh, also our specials are the yellow sheet, it's our little menu. We've got calendars for $15 today, and we've got raffle tickets available for the beautiful quilt over there. And we also today only have our bird's eye map, which is hanging on the wall over there for $10. And then snacks, please don't forget a snack on your way out, if you haven't already. And if you didn't sign in, please sign in or sign out on your way out, <laughs> because we do use the information to track people, you know, CIA type stuff. <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to introduce you to Chris Buck. Uh, she'll be speaking about bird's eye maps, and she's a former trustee here at CCHS, and she was the interim director when we were between folks, and you may have seen some of her writings in the Cortland Standard highlighting local history. So this is Chris Buck, and we're interested to hear what she has to say. Thank you. Thanks, Tabitha. I don't think I'm a stranger to very many of you, maybe a couple. Uh, most of you know that John and I, and John came with me to be my techie today, uh, lived in Cortland for 40 years uh, until we retired. I imagine that I saw my first bird's eye view map here at the Historical Society. It's hanging on the wall over there. It's for sale and there's a copy of it over here. As an adult, I returned to college at SUNY Cortland, and my very first class was World Regional Geography. And with Joe Brownell as my instructor, <laughs> you can imagine why I chose geography as a major. He was a great teacher. I think he still is, isn't he? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, and also, since I'm interested in local history, I try to combine both in a lot of research that I do. Some of my research involves reading old newspapers, and I go to the Moore Memorial Library in Green, near where we live. And above that pesky microfilm machine that <laughs> I have to roll um, is a bird's eye view map of Green in 1890. And week after week, I looked at it, and I began to wonder who drew this thing, why did they dry it, draw it, and how did they make it? I mean, this was 1890, there weren't any airplanes. So I was curious enough to request an interlibrary loan book, and I got this fabulous book, wow. Views and Viewmakers of Urban America. Ooh. It gave me answers to my questions, and I'm gonna share that with you today. Maps really are nothing new. In Cortland County, uh, the earliest that I found, and there may be one earlier, is this 1817. We see rivers, we see highways, we see six townships. The only indication of a community on here is Port Watson in 1817. <coughs> now, that's 200 years ago, and we drove through Port Watson, but it sure isn't there anymore. 1839, we're beginning to see uh, little towns, Truxton, Little York, Homer, Port Watson still there, McGrawville. And then as we went a little bit further on, population <coughs> began moving into the town. <coughs> the scale of the maps uh, changed. We had larger scale maps that showed us more details. Uh, we see the city of Cortland, and we see houses and people's names who lived there in 1855. 1876, we even see the boundaries of people's property. But all of these maps were flat maps. And you can see, uh, I'll give you a little perspective on this, uh, Main Street going north and south, Look at the Randall. Tompkins running in, Port Watson. Yes, look at the Randall Holdings <laughs> on the corner. And look how populated downtown Cortland was with residences at that time. And 
uh, west of Graham, there was nothing. Our interest today is a map that changed the idea of maps, and that's a bird's eye view map, which is a name given to a city map with a perspective from above. It shows an urban area, it shows in 3D the buildings, the streets, and the landforms in the area. The map was made by hand, uh, hand drawn by pencil, and it was reproduced through the process of lithography. I'm going to stumble several times today on lithography. It's a hard <laughs> word for me. Um, the term bird's eye is given because of the perspective of being like a bird, up in the high, looking down. Remember, there were no planes in those days. Uh, and you do have to wonder, how did they do it? Another name for bird's eye maps is panoramic map or a city view map. Another question I had was what caused the development of these maps. I knew that Green wasn't the only one with one and Cortland wasn't the only one with one. Most of the views were drawn between 1840 and 1900, a 60 year period. And that's a time when our country was in great change from rural to urban. People were leaving the farms, coming to the city. Uh, just to give you a statistic, in 1840, 92% of our population was rural. In 1890, in the Northeast, 50%. So between 1840 and 1890, a lot of people moved to the city. Cities were growing. Uh, their populations were exploding for several reasons. One, immigration from abroad. People were moving here. The migration from farms and little hamlets like Smithville Flats. <laughs> <laughs> and longer life expectancy of people. Health care was improving. And not only did the population grow, but the cities grew upward and outward because of improved transportation, uh, railroads, then engineering advances. Skyscrapers, elevators, bridges were all developed in that time period. Cities also multiplied in number. And we think about go west young man and how many cities developed because people from here packed up and moved to the west. During this 60 year period there were nearly 5,000 city views drawn of the United States and Canada. Some for the same cities. You can imagine that New York City and Brooklyn have any number of them. Uh, but we have them in our area too, and it just was a, a pop, popular product. I like to think of these panoramic views as something like Google Earth. You can look down and see a real city. And I want to give you the perspective on this. Um, here we have Main Street coming down. We have Tompkins coming in, Port Watson going out to McGraw. We have Clinton, we have Groton Avenue, and here, whoever mentioned the Randalls, there's their home and a nice carriage drive where they drove in to enter their houses. Before the Civil War, the views have a very gentle rise, but the producers of the maps found out that the higher up you drew them, the more detailed you could be. You could see more houses. You could see more detail, and that meant more people would buy the maps. But this higher view allowed the detail of the homes, uh, the detail of the industries, and it helped sell maps. This perspective, uh, again, 1873, has a face-on view of Main Street, right there and of Church Street. It's easy to see the fronts of the buildings. We see the Randall Homes again, 
Circular Drive, a little bit closer up. Um, Messenger House that was down on the corner of Port Watson in Maine. The Cortland House up on the corner of Grattan Avenue in Maine. Uh, the Dexter House, kitty corner from it. Then we get a little closer view of Church Street and we get to see what a nice job the artists did with the churches. We have the Universalist Church, we have the Baptist Church, we have the Presbyterian Church. I think, I don't know when the new church was built, but I've got to think this was an older view in 1873, I'm quite sure. And we had the Methodist Church, and probably everyone here remembers the Methodist Church being on Church Street. Uh, we have Cortland Normal School at Courthouse Park. There's the building of Cortland Normal School. We have the County Courthouse, where the library is today. Uh, we have a little bit of industry even in this view. Another of my early questions was why were these maps made? And I've already spilled the beans. <laughs> they were made to make a profit. The publisher wanted to sell maps and make money. He wanted to sell a lot of them. And technology in the printing business had changed so that they could produce a lot of maps at a reasonable cost so that everyday people could afford them. Before that, art was for the wealthy people. And when lithography developed, it was easier for people to buy prints. Another reason for the maps is that uh, economic development. Just like today, all of the cities were trying to get businesses to come. And they felt that with these maps, they could show a, a prospect how vital the city was. And a clever artist would have drawn in the, in the maps trains and boats and things going here and there and smokestacks and making it look like a really vital community. Another familiar uh, sound to you would be tourism. Uh, they thought that maps like this might bring tourists to the area. Picture one hanging in a hotel lobby and people looking at the view and telling their friends to come to Cortland because it was such a, an amazing place. <coughs> and last, the map publishers wanted people to buy them for their homes. The country after the 1876 centennial had a lot of pride and people were proud of their community and wanted to display the artwork that showed life in our community. The bird's eye view maps uh, with their detail were sold to the public through the combined effort of quite a number of people. First, the publisher. <coughs> Next, the artist. Then there was a promoter then a lithographer, then a sales force, and then the local newspaper editor. The publisher you might think of as the big boss, or the manager or director of the project. As I said before, he wanted to make a profit. <laughs> Uh, that is John Doe. <laughs> I couldn't find a picture of a publisher other than uh, online publishing, so I picked one out. I thought he looked like a good <laughs> <new publisher. laughs> Get busy there, you folks. Get out there and sell. <laughs> um, he picked the cities to map, keeping in mind that the largest cities had the largest populations, and he might sell the most maps in those cities. He picked an artist to come to town and do the drawing, and I'll tell you more about the artist a little later, because to me, it's a fascinating position. The publisher wrote favorable publicity pieces that he hoped would be published in newspapers. And he also took orders for maps. And most important, he paid bills. <laughs> he, he was responsible, oh I forgot to say he hired sales agents, well he did. Uh, and he paid the bills, he paid for the maps production and therefore 
Most of them insisted that pre-sales be done that would cover the cost of the map. They weren't going to print it if it wasn't going to pay for itself or earn money. Okay, then we have the artist. His first step as a publisher was to hire this artist. There's another John Doe. <laughs> Occasionally it was a local person, but that didn't happen very often. Normally it was a professional artist who went from community to community, painting, 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 or sketching, sketching, sketching. I just marvel at how these people did their work. We have a couple historical uh, resources that tell us a little bit how it was done, and that's where I'm drawing uh, my material. Uh, in Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, a historical society has a sketchbook from an early artist, and they can see exactly what he did and his little drawings, and he says, you know, across here there's a big tree, and you know, the railroad runs behind this place. So he was making his notes as he went around. And then in 1930, a newspaper interviewed a 90-year-old former artist, and he told his story of, about how he worked. Mm. So we know what they did. Uh, first of all, when the artist, let's say, got to Cortland, he would begin by examining the city and deciding the most favorable view. What view did he want to use for his map? Did he want to have a picture from the south or the north or the east or the west? He would be up high looking over the city, but he wanted things for the best. He might pick the biggest houses or the most industry or the railroad station. He wanted things to look good. The foreground of the map is the most detailed, and you'll see that as you look at the maps later, and that played into the decision. Once the viewpoint was established, he tried to gather any details there might be in the city. Uh, maps, if there were any photos of houses, that was a boom uh, that he could do his sketching inside. And he would gather street names because most of the maps have street names. In your imagination, Picture how you'd draw a bird's eye view of Cortland in the late 1800s. You would have to walk through town with your sketchbook and your notepad and try to take a sketch of every single house in town, every single business in town, the parks, the cemeteries. You'd do what the artist did. First of all, you'd go to one of the hilltops, pick out a spot, you might go to the Pendleton Street Hill, or the Owego Street Hill, or Benham's Hill. You'd make a grid showing the city streets, a big grid. And then you'd walk around taking pictures, or not taking pictures, drawing pictures. You'd look at the stores on Main Street, Tompkins Street. After the artist finished walking through town and making his sketches, he drew the city streets onto a large paper. Then he redrew all those little sketches he'd made onto this paper, trying to make them all fit. You know how it is to say happy birthday on a cake and you get to the end and why it doesn't fit? Well, he practiced on this piece of paper. At the same time, keep in mind, it wasn't a flat, straight-on view. He was trying to draw from a perspective. Linda Ruthick told me that's one of the hardest things for an artist to do is to mm. draw that angle. Okay, so he had one big rough sketch. Then he drew another big map. And this one he wanted to be attractive because he was going to show it in public. It was the second drawing and he was going to gather corrections from the public. And he certainly hoped there weren't very many. And he was going to solicit paid advertising for the bottom of the map and around the borders, if we could get it. And more important, the drawing gave him an opportunity to sell the map in advance and get money for the publisher. Then he drew the final piece of artwork. This was his third 
uh, piece of art in a big form. And he either sent it or took it to the lithographer. And his work was then done. He could get on the train and leave town. You might wonder how long this took. I wondered, and it's amazing. Uh, for a small town or a town the artist had drawn before and was updating, it might take 10 days. For a large community or an artist that dilly-dallied, it would be several months. Mm -hmm. But all in all, think of the amount of work that had to be done in such a short period of time. Then we move from the artist, now that he's gone out west on a train somewhere else to another job, we're going to move on to the lithographer. And I'm not going to go in great detail, I don't understand this all myself, but I've got the basics down. The artist's drawing would be reproduced, and I think it's that person copying the artist's drawing onto either a flat stone, probably limestone, or a piece of zinc. Then that drawing was given to another person. He would put wax over every line on the mat and use an acid wash to lower the base plate so that the only thing sticking up was the map, the lines mm -hmm. of the map or, or the illustration. Then it went to the printer. Uh, uh, he wa he, did I say that he waxed the lines? Mm -hmm. I think I did, yeah. Then it went to the printer and he applied <coughs> ink that would stick to the wax but wouldn't stick to the lower base. And he would roll the presses and this is what came out, uh, a print. Basic prints ran one time with black ink. I think we're behind here. Yep, oh, transfer the drawing to the stone. We <laughs> <laughs> got so involved in this. <laughs> 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 the last lines. Okay, well, we can use the review. <laughs> and uh, most of them were done. The basic was one run with black ink, but sometimes they wanted clouds or background grass that looked a little bit uh, a different color, so they might run a half tone. A very few of them were run in color, uh, maybe a four color, and some were hand colored later on, but not, not very many. Okay, the next player in this product is the sales agent. He would be given the maps after they dried out at the lithographer. He'd come to town and deliver all of the maps that had been pre-ordered and he would start working on commission, selling copies door to door. He tried to persuade bookstores to sell copies and he tried to sell in bulk to municipalities. Uh, telling them they could use it for economic development or handouts or whatever. The next person that comes along is the newspaper editor. I flipped a few of these from the Fulton postcard website because I thought they were fascinating. Um, when the artist first began work, the publisher would feed the information to the paper and say, uh, the artist is in town and you probably want to sign up for something. Once the map was ready for printing, they would try to get more subscriptions. The White Plains, <coughs> I can't read these, the White Plains uh, says how the, a pencil drawing was brought in and it is certainly a fine piece of work. The Holly New York article mentions that a sales agent was in town soliciting subscriptions. In Waterville, uh, they were being delivered, and it says a few extras were available for sale for anyone who wanted them. Most publishers printed more copies than they had sales for, thinking that they could sell them. And I've got to tell you, I was curious, did these three uh, get enough subscriptions to be printed? And yes, they did. Mm. Yes, all three were printed. So now the process was complete, from conception to the product to successful sales. 
I mentioned before that 5,000 bird's eye view maps were made in the United States and Canada. The leader in the country, in the United States, is New York State, and we have 536 different maps. And looking at our county, first uh, view of the area is Homer in 1851, looking west. My sources tell me there's one here somewhere. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> um, then, during a 20-year span, we'll look at Portland. 1873, we, we saw that view on the screen. 1882, there were two versions, and I had, until I got here today, a big mystery about whether the 1890s was printed in 92 or 94, and Mindy said there are two of them. There's a 92 and a 94. They look exactly the same, except I have to say I noticed on the 1894 there is no paid advertising that there was in 1892. Um, lo other local maps, uh, nearby communities, there's one in Groton. Uh, Ithaca has six different views, Scanny Atlas, Moravia. But that's, that's it for our county. They didn't get to Marathon and McGraw, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> or Cincinnati. Or Solon. Or Solon. Or Solon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Solon. Yeah, right. We've looked at the 1873 map. On the 1882, um, back last spring I came and looked at one of the 1882s, and Mindy said at that time, I think there are two different versions, and in fact there are. Uh, the view is looking south from Benham's Hill, and to refresh your memory, Benham's Hill is the big hill if you're going no north on 81 between Cortland and Homer. You wrap around that big hill where Locust Avenue goes up over. So this is looking south to the oh. city. It's completely different from the 1873 map. The two versions are very interesting to me. They both have the same image, uh, and Hitchcock's Buggy Works is, boy, right at the center. And Tompkins Street, you can barely see. <laughs> the houses on Riverview Avenue are the prominent feature, and there are cows and fences and so forth. But Mindy got these nice maps out for us, and I hope you'll look at them afterward. Um, the other 18... 82 must have been made for a specialty for C.B. Hitchcock because all the way across the top, all the way across the bottom are ads of his various products. He shows his Portland cutter, his standard platform spring wagon, his Concord, Concord sidebar buggy, and it's got his name. I think he must have ordered it special to use for a promotion. Then we move to 1892 and 1894. When we first look at it, it looks surprisingly familiar. Uh, here again, I'll orient you. We have Main Street, north and south. We have Tompkins coming in. We have Port Watson. Uh, we have Benham's Hill. And mm -hmm. you can just picture Route 81 going around there, mm -hmm. can't you? Yeah. The city is down in its bowl, nestled nicely with its seven valleys and seven hills, if you can count them all. And the next view shows how prominent the cemetery is uh, in this view. Cortland Rural Cemetery on Tompkins, you can even see the gravestones somebody has drawn in. Somebody has drawn in the trees. Uh, Tompkins Street, the north side, the houses are in great detail. And I can tell you how accurate this is. John and I used to own this house at 100 Tompkins oh. Street where we lived, and it's gone now. Uh, with a magnifying glass, the artist did a great job. You can uh, recognize the house. Every window is there. Every window is there, <laughs> yes. The Sheely House, if any of you know where the Sheelys live on Sand Street, mm -hmm. it used to be the superintendent's house at the Cortland Rural Cemetery. And, um, there is the house, and when the house was replaced by the cemetery, they moved it down this lane right over to the Sheelys. Uh, wait a minute, where am I? Yeah, right down this lane over to, to where the Sheelys is today. 
Looking more carefully at the south and east side, we can see that industry was featured. They weren't in two beautiful houses from this view. Uh, we have a railroad train rushing through. We have the roundhouse down here. We have another railroad train over on the other side of the image coming into town. Uh, we have wick wires. We have what became Brewer Titchener. We have Cortland Wagon Company. We have Cortland Omnibus that became Brockway. We have uh, the Cortland Standard, the brand new clock tower building. So it's a different view and a different perspective, but the artist decided that that was important. Tompkins Street was important and the industry was important. Chris, the circle on one of those others was the round house? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right down on mm -hmm. Wigo Street. Okay. Mm -hmm. What we don't see along with this really bustling image is that our nation in the 1890s was in a severe economic depression and people were hurting. Uh, it all led up to the panic of 1893, which leads me to believe on these, Mindy has these two versions, 1892 and 94. The 92 version has a lot of paid advertising on it. 1894 has nothing. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. I'm going to tell you briefly about one of my heroes, Lucian R. Burley. He was educated as a civil engineer, and he's from Troy, New York, born in 1853. He, after college, he needed to find a job, and of course, his time period was during the economic depression of the 1870s. He couldn't find work and took a job as an artist for uh, a publisher, an artist of City View Maps. He then became a printer and publisher of maps. And what's especially interested in, interesting to me is that he didn't go for the big cities where all the money was. He picked small communities in Vermont and New York State to do his work. We've got Wheatsport, Earlville, Canton, Green, and he did the 1892 and 4 view of Cortland. During his uh, career, his publishing career, his name is on 228 maps, most all little small communities. So I give him the highest praise for saving the images of our little communities during that time. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little about sales. Based on the number of bird's eye views that are still in their original frames or show evidence of original frames, Scholars are saying that they sold in very large numbers. The public loved them, hung them in their living rooms, and uh, they were just the thing. The price of a bird's eye view map was based on the cost to produce, and it was somewhere between a dollar and five dollars. Of course, times were different then, <laughs> but it sounds amazing today, doesn't it? And favorable reports were given by the media. They praised the maps, and of course, after all my research, I begin to wonder now, did the newspapers write the articles, or did they just print what the publisher told them? I don't know. But nonetheless, they got favorable publicity. Two of the maps' selling points were to beautify homes and to increase economic activity. But I like this especially from the green Shenango American, where I sat and looked up at that green bird's eye view map. I printed this off the microfilm. First of all, uh, whoever wrote this said, oh, they were impressed with the beauty of the sketch. <laughs> Second, it's historically valuable, and I love that because it is. Third, You've heard this before. The drawing is not yet engraved, and it is absolutely necessary to secure sufficient number of orders to render the work remunerative. And they did get enough. They did get enough orders. Where there's praise, somebody always wants to criticize, and that happened too. <laughs> Serious artists panned the commercialism of these products. 
they said it wasn't art, it was for the masses and it was commercial. Now some of us remember when people said that about Norman Rockwell, that he was only a commercial artist. Well, I disagree. Another criticism, and mostly at the local level, people write about which direction the artist had chosen for their view. They didn't show my house in its best light, or uh, they should have done this, or they should have done that. Uh, in Cortland, for example, the Burley 1890s map that we looked at, 92 and 94, focuses on the cemetery, the homes on Tompkins Street, north side and the industry. But what about the new Wickwire home, the 1890 house? Well, it's got kind of a minor side view, so it's not prominent, although the Wickwire factory was. Bird's eye maps went out of favor early in the 20th century. And there were several uh, reasons that combined to make this happen. First of all, if you watch HGTV, you hear people say, oh, that's dated. That countertop is dated. The sink is dated. Well, lithography was dated by 1900. It went out of style. People were ready to move on to something new. It was old-fashioned, something their parents and grandparents used. Second, the depression of the 1890s had an effect. We have a letter written by my friend Lucian Burley. We don't have the what he was writing about other than it appears to be something to do with customs duties. And it, to me, it appears to have been written in 1894. He says, we do a general business. And when business is prosperous, we do a publishing business in the way of bird's eye views of cities and maps, cities and villages. This latter we have not been able to carry on successfully for nearly a year because of the general prostration of business. We did in 1892 about $10,000 worth of business and in 1893 about half as much. We have been running only about half the time since July 2nd, 1893. Previous to that, we had never had a shutdown. The cause of short time is lack of orders. <laughs> Third, some cities were growing so fast with Eastern Europeans coming into our country at that time mm -hmm. that by the time the artist finished his work, it was obsolete. And you can picture this in a large city, New York or Brooklyn or Syracuse or Buffalo. They just couldn't do them fast enough. So they weren't of much value when the work was done. And the final blow was new technology, cameras and airplanes. So we can consider bird's eye view maps a fad, and every fad ends, as we know, hula hoops and frisbees. And, um, the cameras took over here in Smithville Flats. In Smithville Flats, about 1908, somebody walked up on a hill, snapped one picture, had copies printed and made into postcards, and they were done, and they were cheap. But we all know that fads and fashions come back. Those of us who threw out our pointed toe shoes back in the 1980s, uh, we'd be right in style again if we cared to wear them. Um, original bird's eye view maps are old enough now to be in fashion again. Think of the 1873 Cortland. How old is that? 83. 143 years old. So the maps are collected and valued now. They appear in museums, right here at Cortland County Historical Society, uh, on walls in lawyers' offices and in banks, and private collections. Reproductions are sold at historical societies, right here today. And last, our family photos document changes in our own families, but bird's eye maps record changes in American cities. And they're used by scholars, uh, architecture, city planning, urban geography. <clears throat> they all look at these maps to evaluate what, what changed and why it changed. 
A woman uh, named Ellen Perser wrote a fabulous book uh, that a friend gave me, The Octagon House Inventory. And in it, she has researched octagon houses all through the country and has them all listed, has information about their history and their current status. One of her methods was to get a magnifying glass out and look at bird's eye view maps. And here we have in Cortland, uh, here we have North Church, here we have Grant Street, and here we have Cortland's octagon house. I've been looking to see if she missed one because I see one over here. John and I were just looking at the 1882 map, trying to make further evaluation uh, about what that structure is. But it's not, it, it's got a number of sides. To me, it's got eight sides. So I'll have to contact her. Um, and then one more shot of the Octagon House on North Church Street. It's still there, but not looking quite like it did at this point. So, uh, in conclusion, oh, one more hero before I conclude. <laughs> John W. Reps from Ithaca, a professor emeritus in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell. He's the one that wrote this book, along wow. with many other books. And to me, not only did he tell me all about the history of the maps, but in the back is listed every uh, bird's eye view map that he could locate in the United States and Canada, and he tells where you can view the originals. Cortland County Historical Society is mentioned in there several times. Okay, now in conclusion, um, many original maps have been reproduced, and we can look at them. They give us images from the 19th century that we wouldn't see otherwise. We have photographs, but here is a whole map of the city. And by studying them, we can, in our imaginations, walk a city's streets and view every house, every building, every factory, every downtown. And I hope that you will take an opportunity. Mindy has gotten out a number of maps for us. Uh, the 1873, the 1892 and 94, and two versions of the 1882 for you to look at and consider what, what you recognize, what used to be, what you see now, what hasn't changed. And if you're interested in a particular community, uh, you can look at my book, or you can go online and Google bird's eye view map and put the community you're interested in, like Canandaigua. I bet you Canandaigua has one. Yeah. And you might be able to see it online. You probably right. can. That's it for me, except I want to say I did print in small copies. I have both the 1873 and the 1892. If you'd like a copy, you're welcome to take one. If you'd like to buy a large one and frame it for your parlor, the <laughs> Historical Society would be pleased to sell you one. And I thank you for your time today. Thank you.